আমি অনন্যা 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 নারী অনন্যা তার পাশে দাঁড়ান তাকে ঘরে বাইরে অনন্যা হয়ে উঠতে দিন এমনটা ভেবেই যে অনন্যা নাম নিয়েছিলাম তা কিন্তু নয় আমি কেবল ভেবেছিলাম মেয়েদের জন্য একটা কিছু করব একটা প্ল্যাটফর্ম একটা আলাদা প্ল্যাটফর্ম সবার কথা বলব প্রায় তিন দশক আগের কথা তখন ক্ষমতায় ছিল স্বৈরশাসক মিছিল সমাবেশের উত্তাল সময় হাতে মাঠে বন্যার পানিতে থই থই আর দুর্যোগ মানে তো নারীর বড় বিপদ তাই প্রথম কবার বন্যা নিয়ে আর আপনি যদি আমার কাছে জানতে চান কেমন সমাজ আমি চাই কি চাই অনন্যা তাহলে আমি বলবো চলুন না সবাই মিলে একটা সমাজ করি যেখানে নারী পুরুষ সকলেই এক কাতারে হাঁটবেন একেবারে পাশাপাশি Hello and welcome to the 22nd episode of Shilpa Katha. We come back every Saturday with new faces, new stories and new inspiration. And today we have a artist, visual artist with us and a curator together and they have some amazing stories to share with us. I hope you will enjoy thoroughly. I will be with you all through the time Sadia Mizan as the moderator. And I invite you all to today's episode and please drop in your questions. and interact with the guest so with no further delay i would like to welcome our guest today we have ashvika rahman and utra rajgopal hi hi sadia hi utra hi ashvika hi utra hi sadia hi ashvika welcome to the show and thank, thank you for you. making time to share your stories and narratives and experience let's see you very thank welcome. you so much for having us yeah exactly okay i hope the internet is stable from all our ends it's always a challenge to you know be sure about this internet thing but let's right. see so um i'll start with uh, ashvika Ashvika, uh, tell us where you are right now and um, how do you spend your day time nowadays? I mean, since January, I'm in Dhaka only. I mean, we can't travel anywhere. Uh, that's a bit frustrating, but anyway, I think we are getting into it. And how I'm spending my day, that's a big question, actually. That's a challenge as well. I mean, it took me long to actually get into that lockdown process. schedule now what i do i mean usually i if i have class with parshala as i'm teaching in parshala and i'm i'm assisting tanzi mohab so if i have class then it's online class other than that i have some publication that i'm working on i'm working on my books mm-hmm. and researching on future projects and in between if i have some assignment i'm doing that assignment uh, but with safety all the safety measures and everything in mind i mean mm-hmm. nothing much actually all the city stuff after all this you're saying nothing much <laughs> i mean considering That's our right. regular schedule is nothing right <laughs> okay i mean and, it's just last two months that i actually got the online schedule how to actually have and how to run with it online period i mean the first three month was like a disaster i was always confused how to actually adjust with this situation okay like we all are i think adjusting and learning every day 
So Ashvika, right. you are uh, born and brought up in, uh, in Dhaka or? Yes. Yes. I mean, I born in Natur. That's my grandma's place. But I mean, uh, right after that, I brought up in Dhaka only. Yes, my school, college and everything is in Dhaka. I mean, it's a beautiful city anyway. Dhaka? Yes. Okay. I mean, if you were born and brought up here, then if you have a memory from 90s, then maybe you can consider that. Okay, 90s memories. That's that's a different discussion. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's when you get born and then when you yes. struggle for your you know, job <laughs> and other things. That's a different story. Uh, then, then that, that's, that's always there. The practical issues. But yeah, let's go to Utra. Hi, Utra. So tell us about your daily schedule and where you are right now. How is your life going? Yeah, so I am in a very grey and rainy England. <laughs> I live in the north. It's so grey. Honestly, I can't tell you how grey it is. And it's just going to get greyer and colder as we progress into the depths of winter. <laughs> so I live in the north of England. Uh, which is about 250, 300 miles north of London, if mm -hmm. I put it like that. I live in a, a, um, a county called Yorkshire, which is the largest county in England. And it has a lot of tradition uh, that comes with being the largest county, food being mm -hmm. a key, uh, you know, traditional point in Yorkshire. There is also, of course, the Yorkshire Terrier, which is a type of dog, uh, but I've never seen one here so far. Uh, so there's lots of, and but I'm, I'm very lucky that I live in a semi-rural area. So there are lots of lovely woodlands and rivers uh, and walks to go on. So mm -hmm. I'm very lucky. So um, the gallery that I uh, work at, the Whitworth in Manchester, is currently closed because of COVID. Um, and it had been closed uh, during the summer. It was reopened temporarily, um, but it's, it's been closed um, because of the, the escalation in the cases. On a personal level, um, my work is mainly remote at the moment. However, there have been a few health issues with me during lockdown. So I haven't been able to work as consistently as I would have liked to have worked. Um, but hopefully we're all coming out of this um, soon. Um, yeah. And in the meanwhile, I have you two to keep me company. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's great. So, uh, where were where you born and brought up, Utra? So, I was I was born in Madras, as it was then called, now Chennai, and um, I was brought up in a place called Barnsley, which is mm -hmm. in South Yorkshire. And um, yeah, I have no memory of <laughs> India, but we used to go back all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very much told I was very British when I went <laughs> back to India by my family. <laughs> and I was very Indian when I was in Barnsley. <laughs> um, so, and I always joke because I feel like I, because I'm, I come from a South Indian family. Mm -hmm. And as, as everyone knows, South Indians are very traditional. And people in Yorkshire are very traditional. So I have a double dose <laughs> of traditional values and upbringing. So I, I'm, I'm kind of like, think of me as um, a Yorkshire pudding doser. <laughs> that's, that's how I would describe my upbringing. Yes. Oh, God. That's that's the like I don't know I don't know how to define that. That's the no, first no, ever I don't someone is that combination. That's all I can advise. I mean, <laughs> uh, for those of you, for the, for the listeners and the viewers who don't know what a Yorkshire pudding is, it's 
and no offence to people who love a Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> so it's not sweet, so forget that. <laughs> it's a savoury thing. It's made out of flour and water and and butter, I think. I don't even know how to make it because it's so bland. It is the blandest food you will ever eat in England. But like all things, you must try it. Um, don't take my word for it. On the sake of tradition? For the sake of tradition. Um, so yes, Yorkshire puddings, fish and chips, of course, is also a very British food. That's British. Fish and British, yes. But, um, but and again, I'm sure everybody's familiar with fish and chips. And I'm sure in where you are, fish is plentiful and delicious. But over here, for some reason, they insist on deep frying it. And it comes out looking like it's been through a nuclear war. Um, <laughs> but it's very delicious if you put lots of salt and vinegar on it. <laughs> Even if the fish survives the war, the sauce and vinegar still. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's the it's the only way to make it palatable. But it is delicious. Um, so, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, well, no, I, I I would actually have fish and chips rather than a Yorkshire pudding. I, I I'd okay. say that. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah. And so Here the recipe of the pudding, yeah, we will also go <laughs> with the fish. We're definitely going to try I've, that. If I've there. never made a Yorkshire pudding in my life, and <laughs> I don't plan to change that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sadia, you okay. must, I know you, I know you do this every Saturday, but <laughs> so some of the listeners from England, for example, will be new to you. So you must do a quick introduction as well. Uh, me or a speaker? <laughs> no, no, you, Sadi. Where are you from? Etc. Yeah, okay. for the first time I'm getting this question. Okay, <laughs> I'm from Bangladesh in Dhaka, which a speaker finds amazing. I don't. I find out of Dhaka places in Bangladesh much more better for many things though but still the reality is that we have to stick to Dhaka for education and jobs. I uh, practice as an independent curator and I am the moderator of this program since June during the pandemic we started realizing you know there was a lot happening online but very less was happening with female practitioners especially in the creative sector um, so we started this program with Onuna Magazine. Uh, Onuna Magazine is also a very uh, old pioneering magazine in Bangladesh who have been promoting uh, women in different sectors uh, since the beginning. So that's more, more or less me in the nutshell. I have other projects, but I just don't want to go on those details. Maybe we can do another program with you when you become the moderator without the pudding having some fish and chips together. Absolutely. And that, sounds, that sounds fabulous. No, and don't forget about the street food from Dhaka as well. Maybe after the Corona, I don't know. It's already after the Corona, but the second wave of Corona. I mean, yeah, I would, I miss most the tea from like this, you know, street corner teas and other snacks, yeah. especially when it is winter, the bhapa pita. Uh, the rice cake that we have, I don't know if you know about it, Uttra. It's a rice cake made with jagger and um, coconut and um, rice, um, grain rice and everything. I think so it's that is something... similar to dhokla. Uh, no, dhokla is the pudding, uh, but it's sweet. It's much oh. tastier. Bhapa pita. And then <laughs> and other, other, other rice cakes, basically. So, <laughs> no, you can say it's it's a idli. Oh, it's a sweet idli. Yeah, yeah right. I it's it's, it's a kind. I think you were. Yeah, so you were I, have to, I have to say, I'm I was I was in Dhaka earlier this year, where I had the mm -hmm. pleasure to meet Ashvika. Ashvika, why didn't you? Why didn't you take me out for one of these amazing street food dishes? What happened? <laughs> I I think. We didn't have enough time that time. We were in Raja. Not fair. That was like a short schedule. We actually got chance to went out only one 
No, no. Next time, I'm, I, I can definitely promise that next time we are not gonna miss the street food from Old Town for sure. The kebabs and all the other stuff. Really. Oh God, Ashfika, get rid of the meat. There are a lot of more things to eat in Bangladesh. I'm sure. Come out from the come out from traditions. She's already double dosed with traditions. <laughs> so come out from right. Mughal Azam, and <laughs> let's talk about the things that you know our grandmas and our mothers, you know, kept on in the tradition with this. But yeah, next time, Utra, most welcome. Uh, I will make sure Ashfika takes yes, both of us. Yes, of course. Please join us, you too. It's gonna be fun. Okay, we're gonna try tea yeah. as well. <laughs> yes. So let's move on. <clears throat> um, let's hear about Ashvika. Uh, how did you start it, your journey in visual art? Let's hear about the flashback of your life. <laughs> right. I mean that was really interesting because I actually I was um, I was a trained dancer actually I was doing my diploma in Indian classical dance, for example, Kathak. So I was really dedicated to dance and I was determined that I'm going to be a super dancer someday and I'm going to study in Shantini Ketan, I'm going to do my PhD and stuff like that. And I was involved in theater as well. So my journey was in that direction. That time, one of my cousin who was a photographer, I mean, he was a... I'm, he was an amateur photographer, but he took it really seriously. He was so passionate about that. He wasn't really that professional photographer, but he was so passionate about that. It was like more than profession. So for at that, that time, I was maybe in six or seven standard. I used to be his assistant. I used to carry his cameras and tripods and other stuff like that. And I was so amazed and I was so dedicated to do that. I was always feeling delighted to actually help him and be part of this process. So he was having exhibition time to time. That was so glamorous for me. That was the time when I actually got interested in photography as a techniques, visuals and stuff like that. And later on, that was a very weird incident. I mean, I would say one of the saddest incident in my life happened. And that cousin, he was going through some kind of depression or what i don't know i wasn't really that connected that time specifically that time he committed suicide mm. so right after that i was in depression because since i was so close to that person so i was in depression and i actually left photography forever i was like i was never gonna be close to photography ever later on i continue my study and stuff like I did my BBA and MBA in business and I was dedicated to bank that time and one day I found Patshala and I was um, when I started photography it, since my end in my childhood that time there was not really that proper school of course there was earlier process maybe there was Begat and other institute but that was not really a formal institute so I I found it quite interesting. I mean, I went to Patshala one day and I was thinking, okay, let's see what's going on in photography nowadays. And I was just, I just jump in in a basic course and I found it really interesting that when I started that time, it was more like pictorial photography, like visual beauty and stuff like, for example, uh, landscapes, beautiful photographs, beautiful portraits and stuff like that. That actually gives you pleasure in eyes. That was more mm -hmm. about visual pleasure. And when I enter in Patshala, then I came to know that through photography, you can actually express your feelings, your emotions, even you can actually express your political views, your philosophies and stuff like that. I mean, I found it interesting. It's a different language. You don't need to write anything. You can just throw your thoughts, throw your photographs. You're not painting anything. You're not writing anything. I mean, painting, we are already, I mean, we already know because it has a very long story. I mean, I mean, historically, it has a very long journey. So we already know about paintings, but photography, I found it quite interesting that how they do that. And then I found Shahidul when he was, I, I was definitely amazed by Shahidul because when, how he was working. So I was thinking, okay, let's, let's know how to actually tell story through photography, how to actually describe your thought, your philosophy through photographs, like series of photographs. And then I started more study like diploma and other stuff. Then I get to know more and more that you can even tell your personal feelings, personal expression and stuff. And that's how I actually got into photography. And later on, 
uh, when I started working and I was always thinking like, okay, all right, now I know that photography can actually tell stories, philosophies, political stuff and so on. I can say everything in this world. Maybe I don't need anything. I, all I need is a camera and I can say anything. I can tell any stories and stuff. Then what I'm going to do actually. So I was trying to think something that what connects me. I mean, who am I? What is my story? What I want to tell actually. Mm -hmm. So I was searching inside me, like what is that, that hunting me inside? What, what was that story that I want to tell? That hunting me inside that's trying to come out. So then I was thinking like my journey as a kid, my mom was a social worker. So I grown up in an atmosphere where my mom was working for maybe trafficking or maybe uh, violence against women, sometimes with uh, street children, sometimes with some people who actually went through some violence, I mean, serious violence, acid, so for example, maybe acid survival and stuff like that. So I actually, uh, grown up in this atmosphere so that, that was in my mind that that story that I know that my mom was working and that was in my mind so first I actually thinking that maybe this is something that I want to say in my way my mom was working in her way as a social worker so as a photographer how I'm going to express my feelings so that was actually starting of my work of how I get into this storytelling a uh, social storytelling I would say Mm hmm interesting flashback it was very insightful yes that is even and I how was... <laughs> yes uh, and how did you meet Uttara tell us about that and that was interesting <laughs> that was interesting I think during uh, Samdhani art um, uh, our session uh, not our session maybe during the exhibition Dakar summit Yes, exactly. I mean, Nupura who introduced us, or we just met. Maybe we just met. I don't even remember. Oh my what? God, she does remember. No, because we talked a lot. <laughs> it, 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 is totally upset now. No, no, no. It's, I mean, just maybe because it was like I know you forever, so I don't really remember exactly what was the point that we started talking. It's like I come on, I know you forever, right? So, I mean, I we have oh so many. God. We have kind I of. I just had this poster which shows you have the same faces, and off the track, I we... know you have similar stories, <laughs> family wise, and everything. And you know, I, I think... mean, you can't remember? It's not fair, Africa. First, the Papa we... people, I you know. didn't her. <laughs> now you can't I... remember. It's so undone. I, I can I, I think I know her forever, so I can't really remember exactly what was the point we started talking. And I think we have kind of very interesting, familiar past as well. So that connects us a lot. So when they, we just started talking and we, we are talking like Uttara, anything. are you convinced with this? I know you Uttara, forever. please be convinced. Well, He's you're trying to put on you. I um. I was looking at Ashvika's work first in the Dhaka Art Summit okay. and I was, um, because my specialism is in textiles, I was obsessively looking at all the intricate stitch work and the weaving work in the, the way the, the mats had been plaited in her work called Redeem. Um, and I had, I think, I think I must have been the only person there who was not taking a selfie mm -hmm. with that in the background. I was actually taking pictures of the art <laughs> and all the specific details. Um, but anyway, so um, it, yeah. And then when um, I think it must have been Yasmin who introduced us actually um, because she was, she was very much, yeah, that was it. I, w I spent hours looking at that work. I was, I was so mesmerized by it. Um, and then um, it was, um, yeah, Yasmin Nepal, who, who everyone calls Nepal out there. I call her as Yasmin. <laughs> nobody knew what I was talking about when I kept referring to Yasmin and they kept saying, who, who is she talking Nupurapa, about? Nupurapa. <laughs> Nupurapa is more famous, right? And, and Nupurapa is watching us. She says, I know. So Nupurapa. Nupurapa. 
Um, yeah, she's she's just brilliant. I'm I'm going to carry on calling her Yasmin because that's please go on. Um, so yeah, I think it was through through <clears throat> her and yeah. So yeah. when Ashvita and I um, met. We got we got on, um, I, and I know what she means because we had so many things. We just felt very much at ease with each other, and we opened up to each other in a way that um, we felt completely relaxed in each other's company. And even though we were meeting for the first time, and we just I don't know, we just connected on so many levels. I think because we've been through. Um, you know, various life journeys and had various life experiences that it, it allowed us to, yeah, really open up to each other. And we, we're still talking, so I think something must have happened. But also, <laughs> can I just no, say no. that Ashvika uh, took me on a very scary cycle rickshaw ride in very busy peak traffic. And this is something I'm still recovering from. That's a traditional <laughs> road you need to go through in Dhaka. Yeah, but I do know that yeah. I absolutely loved it. And <laughs> at one point, um, we were both very quiet. Ashvika hadn't realized I was actually trying to cling on for dear life um, <laughs> in the cycle ritual because what she didn't tell me was that the cycle ritual seat is actually that, that <laughs> wide. And so only a quarter of my... What was that, Ashvika? It's not that small all the time. How <laughs> you can see the same same you, you can't, can't see the same on video in Instagram. You can't you actually it. sit on it. You can only kind of perch on it. Without going <laughs> into too much detail, it was a very exhilarating ride. <laughs> okay. But okay, you enjoyed it, it, right? But okay. interestingly, you know, the day we met, within seven days, I think uh, Utra was invited to actually have a talk in Patshala. So in seven days, she ended up having a talk in Patshala, talking with my students. Okay. Yes. So I should also say that I was in Dhaka at the Dhaka Art Summit because I was doing some research um, on female artists who had worked with textiles in some way because I was um, working on a project. Um, Let's go to your flashback then, then come back and, and, and we get Ashvika again for doing these unfair things. Let's hear your <laughs> flashback, Uttra. Uh, how did you got into curating or if any other practice that you came through up to curating? Yeah, so I, I think, I, I don't think, I'm just going to be honest here because when I was born, <laughs> many, many, many years ago, um, curating was not a career choice, you know. Um, my parents had never heard of it. They still kind of don't really know what I do. Um, and, yeah, coming from quite a, tr a traditional background where education and science and medicine were the key, the key um, markers to anyone's life mm -hmm. i i actually had a, a first career in law and i was a barrister mm -hmm. and i did that and then um Ooh. i left that career um at the same time um i left my marriage because it just all came about in one magnificent moment and then i thought well, I'll go and study history of art. So that's mm -hmm. what I did. And then from there, I ended up being a curator. But even when I was doing my BA and MA in history of art, I didn't really, I didn't really fully grasp what being a curator meant, because mm -hmm. I was so focused on the, you know, the, the intellectual <clears throat> side, the, the academic work which I, I still love to this day, um, I wasn't really aware of what a curator did until I started going and working in museums and galleries. And I ended up specialising in textiles and dress and fashion um, through, through accident, but actually looking back, 
it's always been there in me because if my mother is watching, which she probably won't be because she's too busy cooking, I think. Um, <laughs> she can she, watch later always. Um, I mean, she says all these things, Sadia, but who knows? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, she will know and she won't thank me for telling this story publicly, but I'm going to tell it anyway. But because when I was 14, I wanted to study textiles and mm. I wanted to take that as a as an option for one of my GCSEs, which is a public exam. And um, we had such my parents and I, you know, we had blazing rows over this. Um, and you know their fa their famous their famous last words were we are not sending you to that school to learn how to sew <laughs> and so there were lots of slam doors and i was forced to do physics can you imagine physics physics gcse <laughs> anyway fast forward to several years later and here i am a specialist in textiles and not only that now south asian textiles um, which is a great joy and love and and it's brilliant because I just get to learn more and more about me and where I'm from and all the wonderful ways in which textiles have connected <clears throat> from all over the world. So exactly. I'm very lucky that I have been able to make these decisions and changes and in my life but i'm if i'm being honest Sadie, i'm still figuring out what a curator does because it, it, it does feel a bit like project management at times yeah. um and you know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of nuts and bolts that goes on so yeah i'm the jury's still out whether i i feel like a curator i suppose i am um <laughs> that's what it it says in my job title <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, many, many of us in, in curating experiences, whether it be in independent practice or under organization, we sometimes we always go through this dilemma. What we are doing is whether it's, you know, curating or project management or what it is, a crazy idea that we are not sure about. And we all, we feel like reaching out, you know, similar people, similar like minded people and we discuss and and it feels like okay we have some ground under the feet i think uh, well that's what i also felt i also don't know whether i the curating curator word is the appropriate one sometimes i feel i'm the storyteller sometimes i feel i'm the visual communicator um or i like you know think about new ideas so i think yeah. that journey is always um uncertain and and as long as you work with you know organizational protocols uh, you have to go through the stages of project management because yeah. um, it's more unclear to that level of uh, um, society or you know hierarchy that what exactly curators should not be doing. Well, <laughs> I frequently ask myself, Sadia. Um, but what's interesting is that the word curator, and this was. Um, <laughs> spoken about by uh, my colleague who's the director of uh, Manchester Museum um, Esme and Esme Ward and she um, talks about the etymology of the word curator it comes from the Latin curare to care to, to care, care about yeah and I quite like that I yeah. like that idea of caring because uh, yeah I, I think I think that's quite a nice way to think about how stories and people and objects and artworks are brought together um, as long as we care about it as long as we care about it. and i think also i think what's important for me in my work is that um i use my position my influence whatever it is that people want to say mm -hmm. as a as a platform for other voices for other artists for other communities and that's that's what i'm very very passionate about because a lot of people say oh it's a big career change from law to art but actually you're you're just switching from being an advocate in one arena to an advocate in a different arena um 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think that's what really drives me in in my work, that it's about giving other people a chance to to be heard. So let's let's come to that point that you were just sharing about um, the project that you are in and why uh, a part of that you were visiting summit. Let's hear about that. So um, last year I was very lucky um, in that I received an award from the Art Fund UK, um, which is called a New Collecting Award, and it allows um, somebody like me from a gallery or museum to make new acquisitions for the gallery that they're working in. Um, and the area that I wanted to focus on was um, the South Asian mm. textile collection, because I felt that having traveled um, across South Asia um, over the last um, three years, looking at contemporary art, there were a lot of artists who were doing really exciting things in um, contemporary art, working with textiles in its broader sense of the word, whether it was from uh, fiber, single strands, to performance work, to photography, to um, installations, sculptures. And it was really um, um, important that the collection at the Whitworth um, reflected this in some way because <clears throat> a collection that has its roots in colonial times um, has to evolve and has to um, has to generate um, opportunities um, for people to investigate those past histories uh, in a way that's current and relevant. And otherwise, a, a collection will stagnate. Any collection in a museum and gallery has to grow, um, and we, you know, we we constantly want to um, excavate that in a way and to think about what are the stories there and what what do we need to hear that isn't being heard. Um, so it was very important um, to me to do that for the collection, but also on a personal level. You know, mm -hmm. and, and have a representation of named female artists, because as we all know, during colonial times, a lot of samples of South Asian textiles were collected um, for the purposes of um, industry. So mm -hmm. the idea was that the mills in Manchester would be able to manufacture them more cheaply and undercut the market in South Asia. So, you know, we have a lot of samples that originally came into the collection because of that systematic um, industrial exploitation and espionage. And we have to have a collection that balances out um, that, uh, that history. Um, and also, you know, we shouldn't shy away from telling those stories. We should be mm -hmm. honest about how these um, <clears throat> textiles came into play. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of the time when you, particularly in the UK, when you say to somebody, you know, you're, I have an interest in South Asian textiles, the immediate response is, oh, I do love the gold embroidered work and I do love the the prints and all of that and, yeah. and all of that has a place but in terms of how contemporary art has developed and is developing it's about moving beyond those traditional techniques and and mm -hmm. actually um thinking about um contemporary textile art in a in a more conceptual way so this award allows me to make acquisitions for the Whitworth um, and uh, across um, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Unfortunately, I wanted, you know, I, I definitely wanted to incorporate more countries, but I couldn't because of budgets and time restrictions and all of that. So, OK, let's mm -hmm. start with this. Um, and so um, that's that's um, <clears throat> 
project is about. And I'll also be looking at contemporary artworks from the diaspora um, in the northwest of England predominantly. So that's that's now the focus of the project, which is really exciting. Okay. So you were also mentioning you love this work by Ashvika in the summit. Um, and I know some other works that you're looking into. And I can sense there is a different definition of this modern text textile uh, works or contemporary um, works with textiles. So how would you define the modern involvement of textile in, in artworks or contemporary well, textiles? It's a really, it's a really good question because having you know, um, spent hours putting together a very fine tuned application to get the award. All those um, frames and um, sort of framing devices like textile, South Asia, women, they're all being pulled apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by, in, in a, because in a way, the art suffers from being pigeonholed as a textile artwork, but in another way, we could argue that it can be celebrated for that. So what, I, what I'm what i excited about and what I saw in, in Ashvika's work is, is the way um, fibres have been manipulated and also um, the technique. The mm -hmm. technique um, tells a story of mapping histories and those um, have tremendous depth and pain actually in those stories. Um, and there, there's, there's a, a, a tenderness um, to that artwork that um, it, it's, it's almost like it's, it's, see, it's seeping into the soil. If you look at the construction of um, the, the squares and the rectangles, and you think about mm -hmm. the land, and the displacement and the pain that these women went through and this community went through and the piercing of the stitches there is a great sense of um, um well there's a great bond first of all but also there's a there's a we have a great empathy and i think that's what i found very compelling about this this work and also having spent a lot of time in an aeroplane flying across South Asia as you fly into any country you're very aware of this mapping of the land in the architect yes, yes. in the agricultural the area 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 area. Area. yeah and you know that really strikes you as well that before you get to know a country get to know a place you're presented and confronted with this aerial view and you know you're like a kid arriving at a new place you always want to see oh oh what's going on in the ground what's going on? and it's so <laughs> fascinating and rich and you know and and just so exciting but then and then to see that work translated into an artwork and then that's placed on the wall so it's vertical you know so you, you you confront it, it confronts you rather than mm -hmm. you sort of descending on to it. There's a real um, poignancy to it. And it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful work. I think I'm always, always delighted and amazed by Utra's explanation, how she actually read this work. And um, mm -hmm. whenever I heard from her, it makes me feel really in a different dimension. I think we talked about it a lot and I'm totally agree with you, Sadia and Utra as well. I think artists, uh, visual artists or whatever medium it is, I think we stand in between the story and the curator itself. Like we actually collect the story and then we give a language to it and curator are actually collecting the stories and they are putting it in a line so the world can actually read the story. So I think I have a feeling that maybe we are actually standing in between that, the story itself and then curator. So 
I think that's why I actually find it really, really important to have curator with whom we can actually share our thoughts and who can actually give a voice of our dreams, what we were thinking about our projects and stuff like that. This is exactly where I find it really, really interesting when we try actually talk about my work because I cannot really give it in the way she is explaining it. Maybe Let's hear it from you. How, how do you explain your work? Oh, it. yeah, I, exactly. I mean, uh, that was also, I mean, it's been long that I have been working uh, with communities, uh, space, to be very specific with small communities like indigenous communities. So before I have been working on rape and other stuff, which is more about violence. And during that work, like when, I think it's been three years so when I first went to Govindoganj, that was a Shatal Bulli where it was, uh, there was a chaos and there was a conflict between local Bangladeshi community and Shatal community there. It was about land. So there was two people who were killed there. So I went there for a different project. And then when I went there, I find it quite interesting because the whole, I mean, the inter village was like uh, a disaster. There was nothing. You cannot really even find a glass to have water. It was like that because everything was taken out from that village. So I was, I was asking them, how you guys are surviving when you don't even have a glass to, I mean, drink water. And then one lady said, okay, all right. There was, I was cooking something that was on my stove. And when I came back after that conflict, I came back and I saw that, that, the, that even the pot was not there. And the curry was not there. Someone just took out the curry as well. So obviously someone enjoyed the curry, I can imagine. But uh, it was in that situation. So I asked them like, how you guys are surviving? And then they <clears> said, okay, all right. There was a mission charge. So then that charge is uh, helping us. So we all are actually, we all went to the church and then they are that mission helping us to survive somehow. And then I found a marked room. I, I mean, a, a small room that was a, a church. So that was there. So I Did was- Did you share the image? Should, do um, we have the image? The church? No, no, no that okay. was from another project. So I didn't include okay, that. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I only have the uh, image from the project we are talking about, but that was a different project. But when we, I first encountered with that issues, so mm -hmm. then I started talking about that because Shautal, we know that normally they are like lower caste Hindus. So mm -hmm. I started talking about that. How come you guys are ended up in church? Are you guys Christians and stuff like that? Because there is a church there. And then they say, yeah, yeah, we convert, uh, we converted into Christianism. We accept Christianism. And then the, I was uh, wondering like how it's happening. And I, I found it quite interesting because it has a very long story. I mean, when they started converted it into Christianism and when they, uh, I mean, started like, accepting Christianism, there is a reason, there is a political reason, there is a psychological reason at the same time, there is a reason, I mean, there is another uh, religious reason as well. I mean, we all know that lower caste Hindus, they are actually kind of dominated by the upper caste Hindus. So they don't get really that respect and that position. Sometimes they don't get that position, that uh, rights as well from society. The ignored so, uh, minority. Yeah. Ign and exactly. Like some Shautal cannot, I mean, some of us already know that Shautal cannot drink water from the same glass that upper caste Hindus can drink and they cannot get into the kitchen yes. as the well. The beliefs, yeah. Right, exactly. So that was a religious perspective that if they actually accept Christianism, they can actually have the equal uh, respects as the other Christians have. So there is not uh, that we, that caste system is not visible in Christianism. That was one religious perspective. At the same time, there was political perspective as well. And the financial perspective, top of that, that was a financial perspective that the, if they accept Christianism, they can actually ensure the future of their kids and the next generation they can survive. yeah so they can survive so they can get free education they can have free uh, medication and other steps so i find it quite okay. sad because it's not something that you are accepting a religion that is not your belief it's not out of belief it's more about uh, getting financial security and having some kind of respect it's not really what you believe so that was a sad part. And then I started digging into it more. And then again, I went to other part of uh, the country. Uh, that was also about like uh, conversion. 
so i i started talking to some um, uh, shautal people and orao people and then i asked them like how you guys actually converted from one religion to another religion and then they said okay all right so, uh, right after liberation war actually there are massive people who converted into christianism so the map of this village actually changes the christian house the hindu house become christian house the muslim house become something else and then the christian house become something else so i was thinking like okay all right let's collect the map and list let's ma make the map let's just navigate the map from 1971 so that the work uh, it was actually uh, influenced by a actual map from 1971 so right, what actually utra already explained sadia i think you are muted sorry i think i have the map yes i think i think you already i mean that was the map that i have collected so and for me it was like a representation of how actually the map uh, shifted according to religion i mean if we can consider the map of asia and right after partition how it changes to the hindustan pakistan and bangladesh how the map actually have a different navigation considering the religious believers even if if we consider the whole world how we can actually navigate we can also have a religious map of world like this one so i was thinking like it's a metaphor of the uh, religious map of land that we have in that village at the same time we have uh, in south asia at the same time we have in world mm -hmm. so, so that I'm was so that was like a small glimpse how the religious perspective and religious belief Uh, that actually politicize our uh, map and geographical position and stuff mm -hmm. very interesting i don't know where to go from here because i can see there is lot to discuss and do you realize that we have been talking for already one hour <laughs> exactly Or... this is exactly what i i prefer i was thinking maybe we should just stop here now because we, we just have something started Yeah. No, I, I, just, I just want to say that I, this one thing about this idea of mapping and this, um, you know, that it's very, very loaded if we think about the history of mapping, the politics, um, yeah. the way um, land has been shaped, exactly. um, segregated, and how that has impacted on communities. But then also, to bring that through um you know a female um artist female makers it's it's a really important um and very um poignant um part of our histories that have long been um unspoken and yeah. not given um the proper place in our societies because of, of the way women have been sidelined in terms of education and jobs and all of that um many things in social system yeah i i also just wanted to um make a point about um this idea of um cloth or, or textiles being used in in these sorts of artworks and um i spoke about uh, the the tenderness of ashfika's work but and also it's important to understand that you know cloth and material fiber it's so um it's so well known to everybody from the moment we're born to the moment we die we have such an intimate and personal connection with cloth, cloth and, yeah. and that connection um it's it's not just about those personal tender moments but there's also a resilience and a great um strength in the way fibers connect connect with our bodies connect with our homes connect with our identities and when we think about the structure of cloth if you think about it as a grid it you can also talk about it as a form of architecture it's a form of enclosure it's a form of 
um, housing the body, housing our homes. You, you know, it, it's so complex and it's so wonderful. And, um, you know, that's why I am so fascinated with textiles in all its wonderful um, um, roots. Yes guises and, and, and you know this is this is like a lifetime calling for me i can go on talking about this stuff okay and i can i can always extend episodes for this because i can see it always happens with textile the last time i had yasmin uh with us we were talking a lot about the work that she does with textile and we i, I had to extend the episode to a second word like second episode second part of it so I think we can do the same if you both are okay with it. We just didn't start it actually with the works. We were so much <laughs> into the you, <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think it's uh, it's really pleasant to have Utra and you as well. I mean, <laughs> the conversation just went like in a flow. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes when I invite speakers, you know, they're like. Who will hear one hour? What will we talk one hour? And I said, <laughs> relax. Just come. You will see. It's nothing. So how about we do another episode? Uh, we don't have to decide it now. But I am really, really willing to show all the works from Ashvika and all uh, all uh, other images that I, I have from uh, Utra. Utra as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just we only got you know love and care and all the best wishes they just don't ask questions so prepare your questions we will inform you about they're bewildered they're bewildered from bangladesh to barnsley it's the most <laughs> bewildering thought anyone has heard right we'll have we'll maybe we should have more Hill. attractive I mean, it's <laughs> Maybe we should have more, more attractive promo. Well, I, I should okay. tell you uh, before we all go. So the the village that I live in in Yorkshire is called Denby Dale, mm -hmm. and it's famous for its pies. And as you drive into the village, there's a big sign, and it says "Welcome to the Pie Village." Mm -hmm. Right. And it has this great local history of making these enormous pies that were utterly disgusting. But the whole <laughs> get together to celebrate key moments in our in our culture. There are there are books about it. I can tell you. I, I'm going to show you. A, I'm going to send you a picture, Sadia, for our next episode of the day. <laughs> sure. Sure. Sure, I should make I'm sure, sure we have more than is, one hour in next episode. I think I locals sure. from your area is not going to listen to your talk today. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> listen, you know, the, the Denby Dale pie lives on, lives on in people's hearts. And the fact that I have said that it's disgusting doesn't come from me. It comes from somebody who tasted a pie in 1966. Okay, that explains it. That con that is very convincing. <laughs> right, right. On the point. So let's wrap up today, and we will inform uh, all the audience who are watching us on Facebook uh, about our next episode. Um, it, it's going to be Saturday, most probably the next Saturday. But we will inform you. Thank you for being with us. Prepare your question. Drill us with your question. Make us confuse. Uh, tell us about. Uh, funny stories related to textile and other things that we discussed about even food um, suggest us <laughs> things that we can feed Uttra in the next uh, trip to uh, Dhaka after, I don't know, after the flights are open. So yes. she will not have any complaint against me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I will not let you have any complaint next time for sure. I will make sure that. Okay, so our uh, our technical uh, team is just not letting you guys coming on screen because they just got the idea that we can carry on all night long. So I'm just taking uh, goodbye for today and we will come back very soon with the continuation of these stories and some amazing works by these two ladies. Um, see you soon. Uh, stay tuned on Facebook page. Thank you.